looking for truth from God's Word that you can understand and apply to your life? You'll find it today on Make It Clear with Dr. Stan Pons. Listen now as Stan makes it clear. What a great morning we're having. And if you have your Bibles, please turn to Philippians chapter 3. This morning's message is titled, How to Stay Joyful. And it's titled that because that's what the context says, but it's not born out of the fact that I think that you folks are not joyful people. I really believe that you all are growing in your joy and learning how to rejoice in the Lord, and yet at the same time, I know that the Bible tells us how important it is to stay joyful. And so let me ask some questions. First of all, have you ever been on a vacation or you've been away and you got all excited about going, packing, getting ready to leave? And then you go on that trip, and then you come back, and you almost have the after-vacation blues. You know, you kind of get down over that. You know how that can happen. And then for some of you that have come to faith in Christ, can you go back to that time? Do you remember when you trusted the Lord, how when you realized your sins were forgiven, you knew now that you're going to heaven, and you had a whole new life in Christ? Remember how excited you were? And then maybe since then, you kind of don't have that same joy as you had so intense then as you would like to have now, I sometimes say they trust Christ as Savior and then they get a slow leak and they, some of that joy leaks out. Well, you know the Apostle Paul spoke to that same issue and he talked about how that we can stay joyful as well. In fact, that whole concept of joy and rejoicing is found no less than 17 times in one letter to these Philippian people. And these people, we sense, were probably pretty joyful anyway because joy happens to be somewhat at the root of our Christian experience, our Christian walk. So joy is very, very important. Now, I can understand that some of you might be saying, you know, Stan, every week that I come here, you're on Philippians and you keep talking about joy, 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 joy. It's getting a little tedious with me. And you know what? I'd like to know if we can move off this subject about rejoicing and joy. It's almost like a broken record. It's time to move on to something else. Well, let me say this to you. I know how that could be if you hear it a lot. But in Scripture, though, Paul also realized that. Would you look for just a moment at the verse here? Paul says this, Finally, my brethren, still speaking to the church, he says, Rejoice in the Lord. He tells him to do that, and he did it more than once. Then he says, for me to write the same things to you, like rejoice in the Lord and what to do to rejoice and how to rejoice, for me to write these same things to you is not tedious. And he says, why? But for you, it is safe. He says, I don't mind talking about joy. Let me see if this works for you. It seems like the things that you talk about, if they're wonderful things, you can relive them. It almost kind of gives you positive reinforcement. So when Paul is writing about joy, I'm wondering, maybe between the lines, while he's in this dusty old dingy jail, when he's in bondage, when he can't do the things he likes to do, while he's writing about them, to them, how to have joy, if that's not feeding his own joyfulness. And that's why he says, you know, it's not tedious for me to keep writing to you about joy, because that builds his own joy. I wonder if some of us have a slow leak with joyfulness because of negative self-talk. We start talking about negative things. We think about negative things, how bad the weather is, what's going on in the economy, what's happening at work, how my kids are doing, and what's happening in in, in life. And when we do that negative self-talk, that might cause us to have a little bit of a slow leak from joyfulness. Later on, we're going to find out that if we think on the right things, it'll boost our, our joyfulness. So I don't want this to be tedious for you. In fact, just like Paul, I want it to be safe for you. If anything, I want to shore up and reinforce that sense of joy that you might have. Now, let me speak to the men here for just a moment. Some of you guys, when you hear the word joy and joyfulness, that may sound a little effeminate to you because you think, you know, ladies, they're full of joy and they're kind of giddy and they kind of laugh and they're so happy and they're so expressive with their happy emotions. And when you hear that, you think, I'm not that way. You know, men don't do that. You know, we might high-five one another. We might smile. We might tell a joke. And there are times that we'll laugh. Some of us will do that more than others because we're bent with that kind of a spirit. But... For us to say the word joy, that might not resonate as much. But I think this will for men. Very similar to the concept of having joy is when a man has contentment, when he feels safe at home, safe on his job, safe with his career, safe with his health, safe with his finances. When he feels that contentment, that's how he would look at that joy that he has. Because when those things are kind of falling all apart around him, he loses that stability. And there's where he has his lack of joy. So a man won't be that giddy, laughy, happy thing, but it will be a sense of peace. It'll be the sense 
of contentment. So men, while I'll be talking about joy and rejoicing, maybe for you, I just want you to think in terms of how can you keep that contented spirit, that feeling of safety that everything is all right. Now I'm going to contradict myself. I do want you to know that Paul did not change the words just because of a masculine context in the audience. He still used the word joy when he knew men were present. What kind of men were present? Rough and tough jailers were present. Other people were present. And that tells me, men, that maybe we ought to think a little bit more about the joy of the Lord is our strength. And where do we get that joy? And how can we maintain that kind of joy? Well, Paul gives us three ways to protect our joy from having a leak. So the first thing we're going to talk about is legalism for just a moment. He says, but for you it is safe. And so he's talking about joyfulness. Now he warns them how to protect their joy. And he says this, beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the mutilation. For we're of the circumcision who worship God in a different way. He's about ready to launch into a concept about legalism. Now that word isn't found there, but it's defined in this passage. And why that's important for you to understand is because once legalism sets in, it will suck all the joy away from you. But we need to know what is this all about? What is legalism? So if you'd like to have a simple definition of legalism, legalism simply explained is, and you could write this down, rules replacing a relationship with Christ. It's that simple. Legalism is nothing more than rules replacing a relationship with Christ. So how do I maintain my joy? I have to be careful that that rules hasn't slipped into my thinking that I have to live by rules instead of having an intimate relationship with the Lord. So rules replacing a relationship with the Lord. Now, those rules will fall into two categories. Now, you'll have to put on your thinking cap and stay with me. The first form of legalism is this. The first form says this. In order for us to go to heaven, in order for us to be saved, we have to follow a system of do-good rules. So simply legalism says good works saves a person. So there are people today that think that if I keep on being good, I can get to heaven. That doesn't mean that they're experiencing joy, but it does mean I'm going to try to keep on keeping on and doing more. Now here's what happens. They think that's what's going to get them to heaven. They do these good deeds, and then all of a sudden they fall off the good works wagon, and they realize they've missed it. They've said some profanity. They didn't do something kind to a person that had a need. They maybe had an evil, immoral thought or something. Well, when that happens, all of a sudden they thought they're on the road to heaven, and now they start wondering, I wonder if I'm really going to make it, and maybe I'm not. And then they go to the doctor, and the doctor says they got a lump where they shouldn't have a lump. They find out now that they're about ready to lose their job, and whatever they thought that was stability is now gone. Now they have this feeling of what is going to happen here, what's going to happen there. I don't know. Their their joy is gone. Now stay with me. If that's legalism, there is an antidote and a protection to that, which we're going to say in just a moment. But I'm warning you now, be careful of legalism, thinking that by doing rules, that you will then have a relationship with God to get to heaven. Because rules will not get you into heaven. It's only through a relationship with Christ. I'll explain that and how to have it in a moment. Here's number two. Legalism also says that good works will make you spiritual. This is to a new group of people, a new audience. This is now to those who already know that go to heaven is by faith alone. They know how to get to heaven is by faith, but somehow the idea of legalism creeps into their life now that they think, all right, in order for me to be spiritual, I've got to do a set of good works now. And those good works can be social activity. It could be if I read my Bible so many times a week or so many minutes a day, or if I invite so many people to church. So all of a sudden, they think that they're going to have a closer intimacy with God by more rules that they set up. Now, some churches help them out with that. And what they do then is they tell them all sorts of things that they have to do. They teach a lot of lists that they have to do. And so those people think, if I keep doing the lists, I'll be spiritual. Now watch. That too then leaves them because they know that they can't keep up with all those lists. And pretty soon they start feeling more and more guilty because they're not doing those lists. And that guilt is a false sense of guilt. It's not authentic guilt. It's false guilt. So they lose that joy because they thought that to become spiritual, they have to follow a system of rules. And that won't get them to heaven either. So now Paul is speaking to them and he says, be careful about legalism. And he says how that legalism is going to creep in. Now, here's where it says it. Follow along with me. Look back at the passage. So he says here, Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, and beware of the mutilation. Now, why would he say that? When I look at that in my culture today and I see where it says beware of dogs, I thought, I don't really need to be too beware of a dog. How many of you have a dog? How many of you have a pet? 
How many have a pet dog? Raise your hand. Okay, we had a pet dog. His name was Dusty. He was an apricot poodle that Carol dearly loved. This dog would do all sorts of tricks. She'd bring him to junior church, and that dog would obey Carol in everything that, that she would have that dog do. And then she'd tell the kids, you see, even this dog sometimes will obey better than you'll obey your parents. So your dog, my dog right here, is more obedient than you can be. And they'd say, oh, I want to be obedient too. But our dog now is in doggy heaven, kids, okay? It had to die. I had a staff member named Rusty, so we couldn't call him Rusty, so we called him Dusty. This is not the dog he's talking about. He's not talking about pet dogs. Back in the Bible days when this was written, there were packs of dogs. There were vicious dogs. There were loud dogs. They would come up and growl and bite you. They were everywhere you would go because they would often throw food and their garbage out. And dogs were, they didn't spade the dogs. They didn't neuter the dogs. So they were everywhere. And so when he said, beware of these dogs because these dogs are going to come out and get you. And so beware of those. And so legalists, they're out there. They'll run in packs. They're going to be loud. You can hear them on the radio. You can watch them on television. And they can start telling you sort doctrine that will tell you you have to be good to go to heaven. It will sound real good. They'll look real fluffy. But at the same time, they're dangerous. The second he talks about were evil workers. Now, it doesn't explain what he meant by an evil worker. So you'd have to take it to other parts of Scripture. But... I don't have time to take you to all the scripture, but in my study of the concept of evil workers in the context of scripture now, the evil workers were like this. They would tell you that righteousness is important and you need to be a righteous person. Now, on on the other side of that, you're hearing righteousness is really good, and I'm not putting down righteousness, but they're hearing that. Got to be righteous, got to be righteous, got to be righteous, got to be righteous. So then the person says, all right, I got to be good. I got to be righteous to go to heaven. I have to be righteous in order to be spiritual. So they work on self-righteousness. What makes them so evil is instead of recognizing that you will never be righteous enough to go to heaven by your work, so God has to give you his righteousness to get there. And secondly, you'll never be righteous enough in your Christian life. God has to make you righteous. And so your righteousness is really of Christ. So they become evil because the righteousness becomes more of man than it does of God. Folks, listen to this. That's what makes these so dangerous because legalism puts everything on man and takes it away from God. Now, this is critical. Where does all of this ultimately have its source? The source is going to come from Satan himself. Now, here's Satan's thinking. Satan says, I want all the glory to me. Then he says, but if I can't get all the glory, I want to make sure that God doesn't get the glory or whatever he might be getting would not be accurate. So now Satan comes up with a plan. He says, ah, I've got it. I won't get the people to be bad. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give them a false sense of righteousness. And so I'm going to do it through legalism. So Satan says, all right, I'm going to get people to think they have to be good to go to heaven. That's one form of legalism. And so people are trying to be real good, only he laughs at them when they die and go to hell because it's not by good works. Then he says to those of us who are Christians, he says, okay, I want them to think that they have to do a lot of good deeds now to be self-righteous. So we work on all these different man-made lists. That's the key phrase, man-made lists. So all these people are doing this, and they're doing it because they feel like, look at I did this, and I went here, and I gave this, and I didn't do that, and I stopped doing this, so look at how righteous I am. What happens is man gets the glory, but not God. And so Satan looks over here and he says, see, I kept them away from giving God all the glory. Watch, folks. Salvation begins and ends with Christ, and our spiritual walk with God begins and ends with Christ. It is all about Christ and not about man. And that's the argument that he's seeing. And those are the evil workers, and they're generated by Satan's values. Here's the third. It says this. Besides being an evil worker here... And I love this part because it kind of reminds us how serious this whole thing becomes. He says then, beware of the mutilation. Now, I don't have a lot of time to talk about this, and I surely don't want to say it in a mixed audience with a lot of teenagers here. So kids, ladies, girls, go ask your mom about this when you get home. I bet mom can't wait to get home with their daughter right now. And kids, sons, I want you to go ask your dad about this. Sons, ask your dad. I'll try to make it as simple as pie. In the Old Testament, when a Jew boy was born, eight days later they would perform a particular surgery on a private part of his body. That was indicative that he was to be a Jew. It's part of the covenant. Since that time, the Jews began to uh, kind of crank this up a little bit to make it all about how wonderful circumcision is. And I've been circumcised and I'm a Jew and look what I've done. I followed the law and made it all about them. 
And so now what Paul is saying is, you know what? You made this thing all about circumcision rather than about the covenant of God. You made it all about surgery. You made it all about cutting a part of your body. Therefore, he translates that into mutilation. So he says, you went from proper circumcision to nothing more than mutilating your body because there's no spiritual connection tied to it at all. Now, let's go on. That's why he's saying avoid thinking about legalism because it's so dangerous. What's the protection? The protection is let grace be your lifestyle. It begins by grace. I'm saved by grace. Just write the word grace down there if you want. Now, in your margin, you're going to write these phrases. What is grace? Grace is getting something I don't deserve, which is heaven. Grace is also giving me the power to do what God wants me to do in my Christian life. So getting to heaven is by grace. Given the ability to do only what God wants me to do is by God. And so grace comes from the Lord for salvation. Grace comes from the Lord for my spiritual walk with God. I am saved by grace. I am kept saved by His grace. I don't have to keep doing something to stay saved because now I moved away from grace. I moved back into law again. I am also taught by grace. God teaches me by His grace how to honor Him properly. But when I don't, here's what grace steps in to do. Grace then comes in to give me a spanking or to discipline me or to nudge me a little bit to get me back the way I should think. So right now, God's gracing all of us by me bringing this message to you on His grace. He's nudging us by teaching us that we need to get back under grace instead of trying to serve and be spiritual by the law, by keeping the Ten Commandments. It's an inside job. Now, I know for some of you this is a little bit heavier, but if you capture this truth, it'll keep the joy that you often want in your life. Now... As I went through this passage of Scripture, let's look what it says now, because we're going to learn about five examples of legalistic thinking, because some of you are still trying to get it. Go back to the verse. It says this, For we are the circumcision. In other words, we're not of the mutilation. We do the circumcision right. Now look at it. If I was to define what is proper circumcision as far as the reason, who worship God in the Spirit... We rejoice in Christ. So circumcision is properly worshiping the Lord. It's properly bringing glory to the Lord. So it's all about Jesus, not about some act that was done on my body. Then Paul says, however, have no confidence in your flesh. In other words, your good works won't get you to heaven, so don't trust in your good deeds to get you there. Then it says, have no confidence in your flesh. That means don't trust in your good deeds of some man-made ritual to make you spiritual. He says, though I also might have confidence in the flesh, you don't have confidence in the flesh, but if you could have confidence in the flesh, if anyone thinks he could have confidence in the flesh, I more so. And then he goes over this list. Now, there are many ways to look at this list, but I'd like you to follow along with this outline. Because what I'm going to do now is I'm going to use his list of what he thought it was at one time to become spiritual. And there are five in this context. And I'm going to show you by application that we don't want to think that way so that we become spiritual properly and thus keep our joy. So here's number one. These are the people who begin to trust in their rituals. And I'll show you that in the passage. There are people that think, if I do rituals, that I can finally go to heaven. Or if I do certain rituals, I'll become spiritual. Those of you that know anything about the Hawaiian culture, you know that way back in its history, who came over here were mostly congregational missionaries. Some were also Presbyterian background, okay? That was who came here. That was the first Christians on the island. They did their greatest work. For a while there, the Roman Catholics wanted to come on the island, so they started bringing people over. But the Hawaiian people did not want any Roman Catholics on the island. They knew about the Roman Catholics because some whaling people that would come over as whalers were Roman Catholics. And so they saw that those people would have crucifixes up there. They have all these candles burning and all this stuff that the Catholics like to do. All outward symbols, we'll call it. Rituals, we'll call it. And so in their mind, they said, we don't want to have those people coming over because we have shed, as a nation, not everybody, but as a nation, we have shed our rituals of the goddess Pele and all these other images that we had, all of our own idols. And we are now worshiping the true God in spirit and in truth. We have shed all the rituals. Now the Roman Catholics want to come and bring their rituals and their idols with them, and they're going to bring us back into paganism under that kind of bondage again, and we don't want it. Now, what is so fascinating is to see how hard the Hawaiian people fought to keep the Roman Catholics off of this island. So much so that there was a whole uh, army or a whole navy ship, uh, a warship that came here and shot cannonballs at the missionary homes here and on Lanai. I'm going to tell you it was pretty severe what was going on by that. 
Now, here's what I'm saying. It says here that those people that will trust in their rituals to get them to heaven, God says, you won't get there by your rituals. Look what Paul says. He said, I was circumcised the eighth day. All we're talking about, the ritual of circumcision. So for us to be spiritual, it's not by all sorts of um, rituals that we do. Now, let me explain what they might be. Now, we have communion, don't we? And we're very careful to let people know that while you're taking the bread and drinking the juice, it's not about chewing crackers and slugging down some juice. That when you're doing this, you're thinking about the Lord's death until he comes. So we're moving away from the ritual into the image of worshiping the Lord. When we do baptism, yes, it's a visible sign of going under the water. But at the same time, it's symbolizing ourselves coming to the person of Jesus Christ. So keep that in mind. Number two, you'll begin to trust in your race. He says, don't trust in your race to get you to heaven. Some of you might have the belief system that you think that you have a closer connection to God because of your race. That might help you. That's not going to help you. So don't trust in your race. Look what Paul said. I was of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. So he didn't trust in his heritage at all to get him to heaven. Now, some of you might think that you're going to become spiritual Not just saved now, you're already saved, but some of you think you're going to become spiritual because your mom and dad read their Bible, your mom and dad have been a Christian a long time, your mom and dad go to church, your mom and dad do all the outward signs of Christian activities, and so that happens to be a part of their background. That won't get you to heaven either. Here's another phrase. Paul is saying, it's not so much because I came from the greatest nation of the Jewish nation and of the tribe of Benjamin. I'm a Christian because of God's grace not because of race. There was a a guy that I knew when I was growing up. His name was Sonny Blue Eye. Now, I don't remember if he had blue eyes or not, but I know he he had Sonny Blue Eyes. Now, Sonny was a Seneca Indian from upstate New York. He married another Indian lady, Native American, and she was Hopi. Hopi was a tribe that received a lot of support from the federal government. Seneca did not get the same amount of support. The Hopi tribe, when she married into the Seneca, she had to give up everything. And so she married this poor little Native American Seneca. But he trusted Christ as Savior. And I remember him many times standing up in front of the audience. And here he was, this big Native American, dark-skinned. He looked like an Indian. I mean, he really did, you know. So, and he used to say this. He said, I'm a Seneca Indian by race, but I'm a Christian by grace. Isn't that good? So here's what you can say. I'm a native Hawaiian by race, but I'm a Christian by grace. I'm Asian by race. Don't deny that. Celebrate it. But I'm a Christian by grace. I'm a Howley by... Why do you all laugh at that? I didn't laugh at you all, you know. (laughs) By race. But I'm a Christian by grace. So I'll celebrate where we are differently because we're all a part of his body. But what we hold the highest value is it is by grace that brings us together. Do you know what I'm asked a lot when I go back to the mainland? They say, do you have any Hawaiians in your church? And I say, yeah, we do. You know, I, they have this weird idea. When you think of Texas, you think of just nothing but cowboys and cactus, I think. And so I said, yes, but we also have Chinese, we have Japanese, we have Filipinos, we have Hawaiians, some more, some less. We have people of all different kind of backgrounds. We have some Portuguese in here. So we got a lot of folks in our church. They said, do they all get along? I said, sure. You know what? We have never played to an ethnic background in our church. We've never said, we're going to have Filipino Sunday. We don't do that stuff. When we have lunch or dinner here. Everybody brings whatever they want and we all eat whatever everybody brings. I, it's, just, it's, it's just the way we are. Why? Because we're Christians by grace. And that's what he's trying to say here. So shed all this race stuff, okay? Number three, you begin to trust in religion. So now he moves from the Jewish part to say, I was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. And so he thought being a Hebrew would get him to heaven. I'm going to tell you that's not going to get you. So how do I make that little bridge over here to a religion? I'm going to use the term Baptist right now for a moment. For those of you that are so new into this, you need to know that the Baptist is not a religion. I, I, I'd like to say it's a denomination, but there are so many isms and spasms with Baptists that there are so many different denominations with Baptists, okay? When he says here, I was Hebrew of the Hebrews, and that didn't work, it would be like saying, I am Baptist of the Baptist. I'm the best Baptist. I'm the Baptist with a capital B. That's not going to get you to heaven. 
And those of you that are Methodists with a capital M, that's not going to get you to heaven. And now we can separate all the different denominations and religions that are out there. It doesn't matter. Your denomination or your religion will not get you to heaven. Your religion or denomination and your belief in all of its uh, liturgy and all of its style and all of its uh, polity will not get you spiritual. They are separated from one another. The center of it all is Jesus Christ. You're listening to Make It Clear with the teaching of Dr. Stan Pons, founder of Make It Clear Ministries. Make It Clear is dedicated to taking the Word of God with clarity into every person's world. It is the support of listeners like you who make the ministry of Make It Clear possible. You can provide your tax-deductible gift to Make It Clear online by going to makeitclear.org. Or you can mail your gift to Make It Clear, P.O. Box 607-901, Orlando, Florida, 32860. Thank you for helping us make it clear. If you would like to have Dr. Pond speak at your church or event, please send us an email at tellmemore at makeitclear.org. Thank you, and remember to make it clear. Oh, 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 oh,